Um, yeah. Let's switch now to uh, Indiana, where you've been, you know, making your home, um, and and Luger's laws. Right. What should we What should we make of the the departure of, of Dick Luger, and and what his What does his Senate laws say about the where? politics are right now. Well, I think a lot of people have tried to make sense of this this week and they a lot of people I think incorrectly tried to paint this as a Tea Party challenge to the right. I think this in many ways was uh, Senator Luger's own fault that he ended up in this position and I think it's for a couple reasons. Number one, definitely the residency issue. I mean, he sold his home in Indiana but kept his residency for his voter registration at that home and he sold it in the 70s. That does not play well with voters, okay? That says, I've moved to Washington, I'm no longer a Hoosier. So I think once that really hit, once that issue blew up in mid-March, I know for a fact his poll numbers just sank. They went into free fall. So that was a personal issue that Luger had to deal with and also the way he ran his campaign. I think there was a way to uh, confront Murdoch early on, especially because he was a very weak candidate for three-fourths almost all of 2011. He got in the race in mid-February. He didn't raise very much money through all of 2011. Dick Luger could have gone in with a financial arsenal and just annihilated him politically early on, and he did not do that. I, I think that this race has often been compared to Luger's colleague uh, who was elected in 1976 uh, alongside him, Orrin Hatch, was supposed to have his own primary trouble this year. He got out early. He was really aggressive. Uh, the process there is, is heavily reliant on the convention. Mm -hmm. So his campaign was uh, recruiting delegates to go to that convention and vote for him. Uh, obviously, his Utah colleague lost two years before. Um, the other thing, that, the other race that I compare this to is the McCain primary in 2010 when he faced a former congressman, J.D. Hayworth. And the McCain campaign was scorched earth from day one. <laughs> right, right. Really got after him, raised a ton, raised and spent a ton of money, including some that was left over from the presidential campaign, and just ended it. That's a great so, point. Well, here's yeah. my one problem with that analogy. McCain has something like $30 million to spend annihilating J.D. Hayworth. Yeah. And J.D. Hayworth, although a former congressman, definitely was not a great candidate. Right. I would say Richard Murdoch on the candidate yeah. scale. I mean, that, remember that infomercial J.D. Hayworth did? Remember <laughs> him sitting there on the couch? Free government money or whatever he said. Right, you know, right. that is terrible with Republican primary voters. Richard Murdoch, maybe he had stuff like that in his past. We don't know because Richard Luger, Dick Luger, did not run a strong enough campaign to dig it up and push it out. But I think Richard Murdoch on the whole is a much better candidate than J.D. Hayworth. I just wanted to quickly put a dissenting note. I think the Tea Party had a big, big role in Luger's defeat. And if you look at the polling, way before even Murdoch got in the race, Luger was in deep trouble going back to 2011. And I think a lot of it, people think of the Tea Party as very ideological, but they also look at generational factors. We talked about how Luger's been around for a long, long time. Uh, anyone who's been in Washington for, for over 30 years, that's a big, big warning sign for senators, for members of the House, Tea Party activists and conservatives. They want to change that Marco Rubio is a representative of, of that movement because he's a generational change. He's as much uh, a generational, a symbol of generational change as he is of this ideological hard edgy, edginess. So I, I think Murdoch, you know, he's not a spring chicken, but he symbolizes the fact that he's younger and he represents some of the issues that the younger generation of conservatives stand for. What's interesting, though, about him, and that's separate and different, it seems to me, from Marco Rubio, is that Murdoch's coming to Washington basically saying, I'm going to be a polarizer, I mean, or I'm going to be uh, kind of m more in the obstructionist camp. And Marco Rubio is now trying to find common ground on immigration. He's not making as much of the kind of, I'm going to come to Washington and stop the horrible machine in the way it sounded like Murdoch was saying. Right, but if you look at the demographics of the two states they represent, you would safe to say uh, Indiana is certainly in the right red column and is probably getting a deeper red as time goes on. Florida is in the purplish column, and if anyway, because of the large Hispanic growth, yeah. which is why Marco Rubio, one of the reasons I can assume why Marco Rubio was working so hard on immigration, uh, is moving in many ways I, overall more purple right. than red. And right. I wouldn't be surprised, just like Rubio when he came to Washington became a little more of a compromiser, I wouldn't be surprised if Murdoch right. does get elected, he'll have friends, he'll need to sure. work across the aisle. There, there are certain institutional imperatives that force you to work along right. the other side of the aisle. All right, we're going to end the main portion of the show there. Let's go now to endorsements. Uh, Aaron, your one thing that people should check in to this week. Well, we're talking about Marco Rubio. I think that everybody has at least one of their two eyes on the, the Veep stakes right now, the so-called Veep stakes. Um, I thought there was an interesting, I, I believe it was a hotline poll of insiders in Washington, and overwhelmingly they thought that Rob Portman was going to be Mitt Romney's vice presidential pick, or maybe thought that he should be. Uh, I would suggest that people go to BuzzFeed.com and look at the story, 15 uh, interesting things that you didn't know about Rob Portman. One, he does a really good impression of a chicken. 
<laughs> and which, <laughs> which was uh, which was big wow. in Lyndon Johnson's selection, if I can yes, remember yes. correctly, from 1960. <laughs> and two, he he once snuck a kayak into China, which I think is a is a significant undertaking. And wow. we 15 interesting things about Rob Portman because Rob Portman is a kind of a plain guy because he he makes Tim Pawlenty look exciting, right? Wow. Uh, I didn't know Rob Portman had that in him, the kayak. Yeah. I didn't know he had it in him. Neither did I. <laughs> and what, what's your endorsement? Sorry. All right. Uh, I think, along with the story in the Washington Post by Jason Horowitz about Mitt Romney's mm -hmm. escapades, shall we call them, in Michigan in high school, there was a really great photo gallery, including some uh, Mitt Romney yearbook photos that I thought were great. So just goes to show you that everyone was awkward in middle school. He you can look like Mitt Romney now, but everyone was awkward he then. He looked a lot like the character Stifler from American Pie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I don't he think did. we should forget that. Yeah. Yes. You know, the one other, going back to this topic, just quickly, a, a point one of my colleagues made that I thought made good sense is that when they talk about Mitt Romney being a kind of a prankster in high school, this may take that off the table in terms of what they could do to, to lighten up his image. When, when now when you think of prankster that you may, it, which means for Romney, who can't necessarily, who doesn't talk about his faith very much because mm -hmm. of worries they have about mm -hmm. him being a Mormon, whose discussion of his business career is tr somewhat tricky because of that, it just cordons off another area of his past mm -hmm. that may be harder for him to talk about. Yeah. I've got a apolitical plug uh, tonight at the at the AFI Silver Spring, the 48-hour film festival. It's a, it's a remarkable display of movie-making talent, and you have to act, write, uh, produce in, in two days nonstop. And my good friend uh, Chad Horn has a uh, movie coming out, 9.30 tonight, called A Guy Walks Into a Bar, a fantasy story about a wannabe stand-up comedian. So it's, uh, it's a really, it's, it's amazing. I, I don't know how you can make a movie in a week, no less 48 hours, and it's a remarkable display of uh, movie-making talent. Oh my God. That's great. Do they have little beds for them to collapse on when they're done? Uh, they are pretty, th they're, they're running on caffeine and adrenaline and pretty much throughout five the Five-hour energy drink, yeah. <laughs> and I would like to endorse uh, some wonderful photographs in the 1960 Democratic Convention taken by Gary Winogrand. Uh, they were discovered about a year ago, and they tell the story of that famous nom nomination of John Kennedy, but it's, the pictures aren't just of the famous faces. They also capture the moment and the people you've never heard of and probably never will. Uh, they're just great. Check them out on the New York Times website. They were in the New York Times magazine a couple of weeks ago. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Join us here every Friday at 1230 on CBSNews.com. For everyone here at Hot Sheet Live, I'm John Dickerson. Have a great weekend.